Hi everyone, Simon Chapel here. I'm the Quit Alcohol Coach and I'm here to help you smash your sobriety. Today I've probably got my most special guest that I've ever had and I'm really excited to have him on. It's my dad and we're going to talk about what it was like when I was younger and my drinking and a little bit about his drinking story as well and some of the things he's dealt with in his recent life and in his past as well. So without further ado, I'm going to bring him right on now. And here he is, my dad, Mike Chapel, an inspiration to me. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. It's a beautiful day. Um, so, yeah, what's not to like? And you're, you're stuck, just for those of you not in the UK, my dad lives on a, an island called the Isle of Wight, which is, what, 13 miles wide, something like that? Yeah, a bit wider than that. I think it's about 18. I'm not sure. I've never measured it. But it's a, it's a pretty small island anyway. So as well as being isolated in your house, you're also kind of isolated on the island. Well, that's right, yes. I mean, travel was restricted before the virus because of... There's only two ferries that operate transport to and from the island, and they got it pretty well sewn up between them. Charged the earth. It's the most expensive stretch of water in the world, apparently. Um, so, yeah, you don't get off the island very much. But now the virus is here. It's not at all, really. So, um, yeah, I'm stuck in my little flat in the picturesque village of God's Hill on the Isle of Wight and uh, just trying to make the most of life as, as it is at the moment. Yeah, exactly. You can only do the best you can with what you've got. And it is tough for some people. And I wanted to talk a little bit, we'll get onto it shortly about loneliness, because obviously you're there on your own. But first, I guess we should start at the beginning, which is, if anyone's read my book, you probably saw that I was drinking from the age of about 14. And my Dad, in the nicest possible way, and he was a wonderful influence on me, but he used to drink red wine quite a bit. And I kind of felt that that was how you became an adult. And I thought it was like a gateway into becoming a man and growing up. So first of all, did you notice anything going on with me like that? Or my kind of interest and enthusiasm in getting my hands on your wine? I didn't notice anything. And and. To be honest, it, it was something of a, in those days, a rite of passage where in the UK, certainly, parents would introduce their children to uh, alcohol and, and usually red wine at the dinner table at the appropriate age. And although I can't specifically remember a time scale to, to it, I guess when you're in your late teens, you would have, we would have wine with our meal. And you would be included in that. And part of that came from my spending some of my teenage, or year anyway, living in France, in Paris. And, of course, they drink red wine a lot. And, <clears throat> excuse me, my pen friend Jean-Paul, he, uh, he drank red wine at the table. He and his parents thought nothing of it. I thought nothing of it. So when the time came for you... You know, I thought nothing of it. You just introduced you to it, so that you knew what you would, what it was, and you weren't curious to try it on your own. It was, it, to my mind, it was a controlled introduction. Obviously, it wasn't quite <laughs> how I saw it, but you know, these things happen. Yeah, you know, I think that makes it makes sense. And I totally understand it why parents would actually think, well, at least if they're drinking with me at the dinner table, they're not out drinking on the streets, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But I guess from my perspective, the next thing I started doing was actually taking either your leftover bottles to my bedroom, or I was getting my hands on my own and drinking it in my bedroom. Uh, you and oh. my mum were very kind of like quite laid back and liberal you weren't on my case all the time which was awesome and I thank you for that but it also meant that it was kind of easy to get away with stuff I was going to the pub at 14 15 years old as you know we lived in an army town it was so easy to get served in the local pubs did you have any idea I was doing those things no but the first thing I want to address really is what's all this about leftovers I didn't think I left any but <laughs> I obviously did and you made full use of them and I no, I had no idea that a you were taking my leftovers 
up to the bedroom. I don't know when you did it because I never, ever saw you do it. And I certainly didn't know that you were out and about with your mates at the time going to the local pubs. Um, I was brought up in a little village. There are three pubs in this village and every one of the landlords knew exactly how old us teenagers were in the village. So that option wasn't open to us. And in those days, strange as it may seem, you didn't take a bus ride into Aldershot, as it would have been, to go to the army pubs there. You just something you didn't do. You just stayed within the confines of the village. But um, So I wasn't looking for it because it didn't happen to me. And I, I certainly wasn't aware of it at all until you told me earlier this year. Yeah, that's amazing because you'd think you'd sort of spot that I'd been drinking or smell it on me or whatever. I was obviously, uh, a, well, they say that people who have a drink problem can be quite crafty and manipulative. I, <laughs> I can't actually remember, but I was probably coming home and slipping off straight to my bedroom and making sure you didn't didn't realize but we were drinking in the parks we were drinking around friends houses and to me i guess that was the start of a slippery slope where anxiety built and you know i had mental health issues and subconsciously i would guess i was drinking to mask a lot of those things that were going on in my life along with insecurities and so on but which sort of fast forward when I was 25 obviously you and my mum separated and that that hit me really hard I remember literally crying like a baby when that happened and obviously it was the right thing and you know we don't need to go into all the ins and outs of it but I think that was probably where I then turned to alcohol as a as a real crutch to get me through what was a, a tough time for me so and of course I'd moved out of home then and we we saw each other regularly and we and it was often in the pub but I guess what you probably didn't realize was that after I left the pub with you I was going home and drinking another couple of bottles of red wine right after that I had no idea I mean I really didn't I mean going back to, to me noticing or not noticing the signs I think I was more concerned because I didn't know there this you had this problem with the alcohol or this this beginning of, of addiction so I wasn't looking for it um, I was more interested in seeing if you've been smoking, of course, which um, in those days was considered to be more of a, an, a, an addictive drug than alcohol, even though now we know better. Um, so that's what I was looking for. And I wasn't looking for the booze, wasn't even suspecting it was there. And as I said just now, I had no idea that you were drinking to that degree until you told me earlier this year. And I certainly had no idea that your mum and I splitting up had such a devastating devastating effect on you. Um, I didn't know you went home and cried. I suppose, you know, being full of English reserve, we hide our feelings and you would have hit the, hidden those feelings until you got home and then you let them out. But um, I had no idea and I, and I apologise for that. But you don't need to apologise for it. It's, mm -hmm. I guess, as you say, it's one of those things that, yeah, I think it's an English stiff upper lip approach. Although anyone who knows me knows that I cry over everything. I cried on stage at this Naked Mind Live, for God's sake, when I was talking about robbing my son. So mm -hmm. I, I am partial to a cry. And I think I wear my heart on my sleeve and I do share my, my emotions. You know, and I think a lot of that came from you. You know, I've got a very, I'm very open, as everyone knows, you know, my life's an open book and I do sort of share a lot of things. And I think a lot of people who turn to alcohol, they tend to be sensitive and they're often people I, I've encountered, a lot of very sort of intelligent people who have got a lot of things going on in their minds and alcohol can calm that down and ease that sort of buzzing brain that they've got. Mm. So, yeah. I, I know what you mean. I, I don't know if I I was a role model for you with with that, because I'm I was brought up by my parents who were born in Edwardian era, and it, that was just post Victorian. And the values that they had was you didn't cry, you didn't show your emotions. My parents were not touchy feely, feely people, and um, there wasn't that. That openness between us that um, exists, you know, as in now is existing between you and I, and did, I guess, to a degree. But I wasn't aware that I'd been that open with you. I thought, 
thinking back, I was still living my life under my parents, not rules, but under their influence. And that was stiff upper lip, don't cry, don't do this, don't do that. Yeah, exactly. And I, yeah, and I totally understand that. I mean, obviously, I, I knew them. They were my grandparents and they, they were very much like that kind of you know, God fearing people who, yeah, you know, stiff up a lip, keep calm and carry on type approach, which you know, it yeah. has its place. Although any parents watching this, if you've got a child between the ages of probably 13 and uh, 16, you've got some amazing tips here of what to what to keep an eye out for and how conniving they can be. So you might want to go and check under their bed because that was where I used to put it. <laughs> so yeah, I, I didn't go in under your bed for fear of finding other things, but... Yeah, who, <laughs> so, knows, who knows what lurked under there? Well, under a teenage boy's uh, bed, yeah. We won't yeah, go there. get into that. No. <laughs> so... Um, Go, so we've obviously you've been actually uh, I'll share a bit more about how we reconnected recently and some of the more recent events but you you've obviously been you came to the club soda mindful drinking festival which was amazing and it was so cool that you were there and you've been joining in on some of the live Q&A sessions and I know you've been sort of I'd guess becoming sober curious maybe I mean how What's led you to start looking at that? What's your drinking been like? Yeah, I, my drinking has, well, start at the beginning, I suppose. At the time when you're in your teenage years, I was drinking, I was drinking a couple, at least a bottle of wine a night. And uh, I remember on one occasion <clears throat> when I went and had dinner with neighbours across the road, between us, we... Well, we, we demolished a wine box and it was only me and uh, um, the lady drinking. The husband was a news agent, had to get up early in the morning. And we finished the wine box and I must have had three bottles of wine that night. And I always remember the day, the morning after, I, I didn't have a hangover as such, didn't have a headache. I just couldn't function. I was just completely out of it. I don't know if you remember that day. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And... It, and Ever since then, I've moderated it. And my drinking habits now are that I'll have a can of beer with my evening meal, and that's it. If I don't have a can of beer, that can of beer, then I'll have something non-alcoholic, not as in a proprietary non-alcoholic beer, but it'll be a Diet Coke or um, um, lime juice and iced water. Because I do like a cold drink for some reason. Something that's happened recently. I do crave cold drinks. It doesn't have to be alcohol, and a lot of the times it isn't. But, yes, you're right. I am becoming um, sober, yeah, sober curious. Is that the phrase you use? That's the phrase, yeah. yeah. Sober curious. Because I've seen the difference it's made to you, and I've seen the problems that people can suffer, and I know that that could be down the road for me. So, yes, I am looking to quit alcohol. And as I say, it's not something I drink a lot of these days. Um, so I don't think I'll have too much trouble quitting. And I'm, in, and I'm not <clears throat> putting myself in the same position as the people that I've seen on your, your, your various podcasts who really have got, had serious problems. And bless them, they've they managed to, to come and kick them and come out the other side, which is great. Now, I've not got that problem in terms of having an addiction, but I can see that it could go that way, especially with current situation with the, the virus, which I think is more serious than any of us realise. Um, and that might lead to some sort of depression or but could fuel alcohol. So it's something I'd like to address now, you know, very, very quickly and see if I can kick it full stop and then it will never be there in the fridge for me to fall back on if that makes sense yeah no it makes complete sense and i think once you start to experience the incredible changes that happen both internally like your mood and your you know any sort of mental health as your brain rebalances you see your skin improving any darkness under your eyes or you know, all these wonderful things going on it just spurs you on to keep going and yet the number of people who say to me 
several months into it i wish i'd done this 20 30 years ago you know why the the whole world just seems to have a new vibrance and color and it it the best way of describing it it's like when you find a religion or you find god and you just think my god why can't everybody else see this why why does no one else realize but of course it's kind of tough at the start to get through it when even, even when you drink moderately there's still that neural pathway that alcohol is a coping mechanism or it serves a purpose to de-stress or whatever i mean if if you were to kind of put it into a couple of words maybe what would you say the main reasons you drink are like why do you think you like to drink is it stress or is it fun i don't think it's stress but i'm not sure because i've never really stopped to analyze it but because i can either drink a cold beer or any other cold drink. It might be a, uh, uh, you know, a Coke Zero or something. It has to be straight out of the fridge and it has to be cold. And to me, it seems it's almost, and I'm probably being self-delusional here, but it is a reason of thirst as to why I think oh, I'll have a drink. Um, and I think maybe it's creeping up on me and that, Having a beer with my evening meal is becoming a habit. I never used to. A few, you know, uh, well, this time last year. Well, not this exact time, but, you know, it, I didn't used to have a beer with my evening meal. It's just something that came along after the events of uh, a year ago, which I guess we'll go into later. Yeah, obviously it was a year ago today that your wife, Angela, passed away. God rest her soul. She was such a wonderful lady. And, it, you know, I know that must have been such a tough time for you. And at that time as well, you and I were actually out of contact. We'd had six years um, apart where we didn't talk to each other over a ridiculous, petty argument, probably partly down to my relationship with alcohol and my state of mind at the time. But I, there's a couple of things I really wanted anyone who watches this to get out of today that I think you'll be able to share some insight on and not necessarily to do with drinking or not drinking and they really are you know you've dealt with probably one of the toughest things that could come up in somebody's life you've lost your significant other the person you loved and honestly you coming on here today the anniversary of her passing away to do that you know i find that amazing and incredible and again inspiring like you seem to always do with me and thank you for for doing it and for sharing and you know and i hope that in some small way people watching this will get something from those horrible events and i guess the couple of things are first of all how you dealt with such a traumatic and out of the blue shocking event and secondly since then you've obviously been living on your own we touched on isolation at the start around loneliness whether there's any tips you can give anyone for loneliness and obviously yeah the first question is around sort of trauma and how how i mean um, you might say i didn't actually cope but kind of what were there go-to tools or things that you found helped you through that terrible loss yes um well you know without going into the nuts and bolts, bolts of it it was a very sudden death taken ill on on the Monday and uh, airlifted to Southampton Hospital the Tuesday and was operated on and died in the early hours of the Wednesday morning. So within space of three days, she'd gone. Now, initially, it was a great shock. And I know that I was walking around in a state of numbness, really. Yeah, um, it, it just, I didn't, I couldn't, um, I couldn't understand it. I certainly couldn't process it. And um, initially, there was lots to do, which there always is when somebody dies. Um, and there was Angela's son, his family, and her daughter, her daughter and her family, all suffering at the same time. So we initially were a great comfort to each other. Um I also was a member of a amateur dramatic society, still am, and they were very, very supportive, as were the uh, the, the people from uh, Angela's and now my church, because as you, you alluded to earlier, I've since found God as well. 
I was in the process of doing that when Angela passed away. But uh, so I got comfort. I drew comfort from various sources that presented themselves to me because people were contacting me, looking after me, checking I was okay. It's happening now again this this week. People are sending messages of support, which is great. But um, so to go on after that shock, you then come to terms with it and try and understand it. Um, I found, again, initially I was having loads of things to do, forms to fill in, all this sort of thing. And then I was going through cupboards and doing all sorts of things, daft things, just to take my mind off it. But I gradually started coming, not not coming to terms with it. I gradually started to understand what had happened, and and, uh, and and just and I just went with the flow. Now, of course, with the virus, I'm stuck in the flat on my own that used to be ours, and I'm surrounded by all, all the mementos, photographs, all the clothes are still in the wardrobes. Um, and we'll stay there for until I'm ready to let them go, but. Um, you, all you can do is draw on your on the support that's offered to you, um, and also draw on your own inner strength. Um, so does that answer your question, or have I not touched it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's such a it's such a like unimaginable event. Like mm. I, I don't even know what I would do. I know I wouldn't drink because I know it wouldn't help the situation. Yeah. But it, it, I don't think there's a way of saying, you know, you can't make it go away. You've effectively got to stand in the storm and you've got to yeah. take, you know, and the, the storm might blow the roof off and it might shatter the windows and you've got to stand in it because running away from it, I, I don't know, I've not been there, but running away from it to me would, probably be the worst thing you can do and mm. you've got to talk it out with people cry it out and sure life might never be the same again and it, that is the way it is i suppose there's no sort of easy way of of dealing with it there's no magic formula or magic wand is there well no i i didn't i certainly didn't turn to drink that was the last thing i did um, that was my I next didn't. question did you find yeah, that you were drinking more after the event no um, if anything, I was drinking, drinking less immediately after Angela passed. Um, it's only after, probably over the last maybe three or four months, where I've been having a um, a can of Stella as it goes um, with my evening meal, and uh, that's as I say, it's, it's become a habit more than anything else. And I can certainly. I'm not addicted to it. I can, if I don't have a beer in the house, so be it. And I just have something else. So, but as I say, I didn't turn to drink because I knew that, and it's just, and it's not from what I've learned from you over the recent weeks, is I realised myself that it would not be the answer. It would not make anything go away. It might numb the senses um, uh, temporarily. But thereafter, it would then probably have led to hangovers and all the other things you associate with it. So to me, it, it wasn't an option. I, it, it, it did occur to me that I might drink, but I dismissed it. So, And I think I was just lucky, really. That, um, and then when we made things, patched things up and I got to know what you were doing and getting involved with it, I can see that. I was incredibly lucky um, that I did take that conscious decision not to drink because if I had, I'd have pre probably been on one of your, uh, I'd have been one of your your customers if you know what I mean. Customers, and, yeah. Well, no, you know what I mean. I'd have, I'd have been yeah. going onto your websites to save my life rather than as I do now to out of an interest, sober curious interest, and also to support you. So. Yeah, exactly. Which is awesome, by the way. But that you're yeah. right. You know that could have really been a slippery slope because That's you, it. Think, well, I can blot blot it all out for a few hours, and but the next morning it's going to be back and probably in high definition as well. Yeah, you know, worse than it was the night before. It doesn't change yeah. anything. It just no. buys you a short term relief. So it's awesome that you could make a conscious decision like that. So. Yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, you've shown incredible strength to come through what is, 
as I say, probably one of the worst things that could happen in someone's life. Uh, mm. It really is. And yeah, and it's a year today, which is you know, obviously we're all thinking of you at, at this mm. time. And hopefully everyone else watching this will be as well. And you'll get loads of amazing comments. The So the other thing moving on from that as well is loneliness. I get asked all the time about loneliness, how to deal with it. People who are at home, especially during the isolation, but they've not really got a lot of people around them. They turn to drink because it does what we just said. It, it They can detach from reality for a bit. So you, I would say are successfully lonely if you know what i mean in the nicest possible way you seem to do it well you're always happy so i think you've you've got a circle of friends you've got activities that you do so when i say lonely all right successfully isolated is a better way of putting it so you're not you know you have you're not in a house with a big family around you you live on your own and that's what i mean lonely sounds like a stigma which is absolutely not that's not what i'm saying but, but you, you do it well so would would you be able to share maybe some tips for living on your own and not feeling lonely? How do you do it? Well, yeah, I think it's it's a number of reasons. I mean, to set the scene, I live in a first floor flat in a pretty little village on the Isle of Wight called God's Hill. I've got some beautiful views out of my windows across the fields, there's sheep in the field. And then the, out the other window, you've got the village itself, the village church, and, it, and it's really picturesque. And it, I f find that helps in a small way, looking out the windows, appreciating the views, looking at nature. I've got a, fortunately, though, I've got a first floor flat. I've got two gardens, one front, one back. So I can spend time gardening, which is something I hate. And then <laughs> to the point where I've employed... A gardener, which sounds grand, but it isn't. But um, because Angela loved gardening and prided herself in a garden and was always receiving compliments for how nice it looked. So when she went, I had a big job on my hands to, to keep those standards up. And knowing me, I knew I wouldn't be able to do that on my own because I have a, no idea. All I do is mow the lawns and the gardener does everything else. But I can go out in the garden, which helps. Um, so going back to the original question, um, uh, tips for dealing with it. Um, if you've not got a garden and you are in my position, then it's it's less, it's worse th than my situation, um, especially in the current times. I mean, you can't go out anyway. So what I tend to do is I, I find that I've, I've developed now a routine, which is important, um, that, Otherwise, if you don't have a routine and then follow it, you become very much a couch potato, loafing about, doing nothing, drifting aimlessly, just watching the news, which just reinforces all the negative aspects of life at the moment. And you could probably fall into some form of mild or serious depression. I don't know. But I saw that on the horizon and thought, right, OK, yeah, it's going to be a routine. And it is a pain in the butt sometimes to follow the routine. You think, do I really need to do this today? And the answer, of course, is yes, you do. Now, initially, I I looked at all the jobs I wanted to do in the place, in the flat, which was clear out all the cupboards. My late wife, Angela Blesser, was a collector. <laughs> Some might say <clears throat> a hoarder and was never happy having one or something if you could have six. I've seen this um, firsthand, by the way. I've seen yeah. it firsthand, yeah. I, I've got enough white hand towels in my airing cupboard to open a small guest house. And there are only two of us. I, I think when I last counted them up, there were 16. <laughs> it, it was like that throughout the flat. The cupboards were full. Every, if I give Angela a horizontal service, surface, she'd cover it with stuff. You can never see what everything was on. You couldn't see the top of the table or the anyway bless her that was Angela and, I, and, I, and one of the things I loved to fall but for me it wouldn't do I, I couldn't deal with that I was I'm a minimalist so I had all these cupboards to go through and I went at it like a bull in a china shop trying to get as much done as quickly as possible and then I thought to myself hold on you've got x number of weeks of this self-isolation left what you've got to do is pace yourself and give yourself something to do each day 
and even if it is clear a cupboard out, do this, do that, it's there on my list, and I'm going through it. Now, I haven't made a list physically; it's just in my head. I'm not one pedantic, but um, so yeah, it's um, I'm going through this this list of jobs, getting them done, and that's a therapy in itself, and does raise your self-esteem when you look at what all the jobs you have actually done and yeah i do have days when i've got i look at my list I look at the jobs for today and i think bugger it no i'm not going to do it and that's not a bad thing that's not wrong because sometimes you do need a break and i found that i do and i might have one or two days doing exactly what i'm trying not to which is loafing about on the sofa watching the tv news but I just need to do that account. And it's probably recharging batteries as well. I don't know. But um, So, yeah, routine, um, sticking to it as far as you can. Going out in the garden, in my case, it's unfortunate to have that. And that's it, really. I mean, you can't go out anywhere. You can't – people can't come and see you. I've always been – I've been lucky in as much – I've always been happy in my own company, which helps. I, you know, I, I've always been the same. Some people call it a loner. I'm not a loner, definitely not that. But I, I can sit on my own, you know, quite happily. Yeah. Um, listening to music or, or doing whatever. So I'm lucky in that respect. And it's not everybody can do that, and they they're not happy in their own company. So, you know, my advice to them is to do what I, I've done. You know, set yourself tasks, targets, if you like. Um, because that will give you something to do or keep you occupied. And as I said just now, once you've done it, once you've achieved it, the, the satisfaction that gives you and increases your self-esteem as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think another big thing is uh, obviously aside, lockdown aside, you know, f- making sure you understand what your passion is, finding some passions in your life. And you know, with amateur dramatics, you know, you're really, really passionate about it. You're actually really good at it too. And you know, Thank you. you might not have discovered that for, you know, you discovered it at a certain time in your life. And that's, mm-hmm. it's so good to have a, a passion. And a lot of people say, well, where do I find it? How, how do I know what my passion is? How do I know what I love? To me, I don't know about you, but it goes back to looking at your core values and seeing what actually lights you up as a person. Yeah. Adulation on my case. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah. You don't do it for that reason. It's because you enjoy it and you meet lots of people and, um, and I, from it, I've got lots of friends who are good friends and who, who care about me and I care about them. And it, it, it's, yeah, I mean, find, as you say, finding something you're passionate about. I mean, I, you know, my musical tastes. <laughs> sadly, sadly, I've, uh, I've inherited some of them. Have you really? You're not into yes yet, I take it. No, no, not yes. That's, no, a, I mean, that's a 70s rock band for anyone who's uh, interested or prog rock, I think they're called. 70s they're still going now they're still touring they're 70s albums (laughs) even though they're all in their 70s and 80s yeah (laughs) but all all the good bands are now but um yeah that's not quite true but uh yeah so i've got music which i find a great therapy and i stick the hi-fi on as you know i've recently um got alexa in my life which is just making me lazy because i can just say alexa play this alexa play that and now i've find putting a cd on or a vinyl on is a chore oh i'll I'll ask alexa to play it instead so that's you know there's a bit of a negative side to that but um yeah so the other passion that you know is is man united and of course that's that's uh all been shelved now until god knows when so for anyone in the US, Man United are a soccer team. Um, well, they're a pretty big soccer team. They're not quite as good as they used to be. But again, that's a passion of yours. You watch all the games that are on TV and you know you know all the players and follow all the all the news. But yeah, it's another thing that's been put on hold. Mm. Yeah, they've been taken away from us. I mean, I'm sure in the, in the States, for example, it's the same with their uh, football. <laughs> it's our word, football, not yours, by the way. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> Uh, You're going to start some a debate about that one. Yeah, well, why not? Let's all have a debate about it. But no, you know, they're, they're staff of their sports and it's a big thing in people's lives and uh, something else that's missing, something else that would have been a, 
crutch is the wrong word, but a support mechanism for them. But um, yeah, I mean, I've yeah, I mean, I've got I'm passionate about things Beethoven as well as yes, um, and Biffy Clyro like that. But yeah, anyway, one of my favourite no, bands. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. But yeah, so yeah, if you've got passions, indulge yourself in them and uh, and um, help ease the pain, I guess, of, of isolation and loneliness. I mean, I'm fortunate as I say. I don't necessarily feel lonely. I feel isolated for sure. Um, but I think that's more because of my psychological makeup, in as much as I said earlier. I'm happy in my own company, so that does help, and it is an awful lot of help. Um, my heart goes out to people who are not lucky enough to be the same. Exactly. But then you, you, know, you can connect with people online. There's sober yeah. communities. There's non-sober communities. You know, there's just communities for everything. There's amateur dramatics communities, <laughs> whatever, your, whatever your passion is. But take the time to find it and look at your core values i think it was the other thing that was really interesting that you said was about how you have jobs for the day and maybe a list of things you want to get done and sometimes you you rush through it and then you're like oh my god it's only you know one o'clock in the afternoon i've finished everything and somebody else said that to me last (coughs) week they rush through all their jobs then they've done by one o'clock then they start drinking early afternoon so my advice was actually just to space them out do one thing at a time actually kind of almost schedule it i know you said you don't write it down but it might actually help in some instances to almost create a timetable if you want to kind of block out the times when you might be triggered to drink or want to kind of get past those those moments and and again, just fill in that time where you might feel lonely or you might feel isolated, I guess. You know, the other advantage of creating a physical list is, and I mean, we've all done it probably in our working lives, I know I have in the past, is that you've got your to-do list. Um, and then as you go through it and you tick them off, you start to feel better in yourself because, A, you've got a shorter to-do list. And B, you've actually, if you have a done, convert that to jobs I've done list, that actually makes you feel better. And again, helps with any self-esteem issues that we all suffer from, let's face it. Um, Your self-esteem was yesterday's video. So if you've not seen that, it's on this YouTube channel, the self-esteem one. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, well, I haven't looked at that, but I will have a look at it. Um, but yeah, my, my, you know, it does help your self-esteem. You feel proud of yourself and pleased that you've ticked off all the, you know, the, the various lists of things that you wanted to do that day. And say, as you say, don't rush it. My, my, <laughs> the way I deal with it, with not rushing it, is to do one job and I'll have a cup of tea, and then I'll do another job and then I'll have a cup of tea, and it's those little tea breaks in the middle that help you stretch it out and you don't rush it and you don't get yourself into the situation that you mentioned where if you are drinking um you get them all out of the way quickly and think oh now i can drink this afternoon but if you never quite if you spend all day doing the jobs and drinking tea then you haven't got time for for anything else for drinking anything else anyway but um yeah so yeah that's a great hey, tactic that's but that's such an awesome tactic drink have a little new habit in between the jobs stretch yeah. them out over the day and drink tea this is perfect i love it that's such a such a great tactic that's going in my next book <laughs> the tea, the tea uh, tactic. well yeah i mean it, it's i mean it's not obviously there's no alcohol involved and it won't take the place of the alcohol but it might it well it might take the place of it in, not in terms of the physical responses, but you know, it, 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 you're drinking something. You've got a mug of tea in your hand, and it might sort of be a substitute in a way. I mean, I hope for people it is, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing with having a tea, of course, is biscuits. Yeah. Now, do you know I'm diabetic, so I can't have biscuits? So I thought it doesn't apply to me, but you know. Make sure you don't start binging on the biscuits if you're on the upper tea, because that's easily done. 
Well, it is. Although I often say to people when they're quitting drinking, if you have a few other treats, you know, short short term, then they I don't think there's a huge problem with that. And it's something that could be looked at a little bit further down the line. But I know what you mean. It can be easy for two or three biscuits to turn into the entire packet. And before yeah, you... I do occasionally have a packet of biscuits. And it goes. <laughs> with or without a cup of tea. and But that's when I fall off. I don't, I'm not being flippant here, but when I fall off my particular wagon, which is not having sugary stuff because of the diabetes, um, you know, that's I, – I, I have a relapse every now and again, and I'm not suggesting you can do that with alcohol because I think possibly a relapse might turn out to be more than that from what I've learned from, from your – from uh, Be Sober and um, Naked, Mind, Naked Mind and all the other uh, the things that I've been looking at recently. Um, so yeah, I'm not being flippant. Um, please don't think of that. But no. it, it, you know, diabetes is a serious condition, and, and if I ate loads of sugary stuff, it'd be curtains. But um, so I just don't on a daily basis. Don't have sugary stuff, and then occasionally I have a packet of biscuits. But I don't care. Well, yeah, from time to time, it's good to have yeah. a treat, isn't it? Well, look, yeah, but- thanks. For- Thank you so much for coming on and sharing. It's just so amazing to talk to you and listening to everything that you've got to say and share. And obviously we're all thinking of you today and thinking of Angela as well. And well, yeah, thanks again. Is there anything else you want to share with um, with anyone watching this? Any lockdown tips or anything like that? Or? Lockdown tips, yeah. Don't go out. That's the Don't one. Go out. There you go. You heard it first. <laughs> um, no, I mean it's 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 there for all of us to deal with in our own way, and uh, and if you think you're struggling, then look for and find support because there will be support out there. I mean, what you do, Simon, is a great, great, a great tool and, and support for people who are trying to give up alcohol. And, and I'm so proud of you for for what you do, oh, the way you do it. Well, you are. I mean, I watched the other day you doing one and. Um, uh, and you were so passionate, and you know, I know <laughs> you were talking like ninety miles an hour like a Gatling gun. But there again, you always did. So that doesn't surprise me. But um, I do get carried away sometimes. So I'm not going to well, lie. No, there's nothing wrong with that because you're passionate, and and uh, and what you're saying is true as well. So it, you know, and it's helping people. So more power to your elbow. Yeah, oh, thanks. It means a lot that you, you know, you're actually now with me on this journey. We've reconciled yeah. after six stupid years of not having contact, and you know, and we're, you know, we're together again. We're we're moving forward with our own relationship, you know. And obviously, our, my son Robin, your grandson, is so happy to have you back in his life. Michelle, my wife, it's just yeah, it's just wonderful again. So, and thank you again for coming on because it, it just means a lot to me as well. That's all right. It's a pleasure, my boy. Thank you.